I'm Anya. And I'm Alan. And this is Shadows and Shamblers. Please stand as you are able for this week's reading, which comes to us from the Book of World. Love is the most powerful weapon of war. Now you may be seated. This week, we watched American Gods, Season 2, Episode 2, The Beguily Man. So, Alan, what did you think? Uh, I found this episode more uneven than last week's. Uh, I really love the flashback story about Shadow, but Laura's story kind of, like, confused me, and Wednesday's story, like, honestly just annoyed me. Um, There were good moments in each of those stories, but they felt like kind of half-baked to me. I really love the flashback, but everything else was really hard for me. How about you? I think I'm more positive on this episode than you are. Uh, Like you, I really loved the flashbacks overall, Um, although I did have some complaints. I don't think they quite succeeded in building the thematic message they were going for. But then I was more mixed on the side plots. I actually liked the Laura Mad Sweeney one, um, though I agree that Wednesday was not great. But before we get too deep into that, let's talk about this week's creators. This episode was written by Tyler Danucci and Andres Fisher Centeno. Danucci has been a writer's assistant on Star Trek Discovery and Helix. Fisher Centeno has written for Under the Dome and The Terror. This episode was directed by Frederick E. O. Toy. He has directed lots of TV, including episodes of Alias, Person of Interest, and Westworld, uh, which are all fabulous shows uh, in their own way. Definitely, yeah. I Yeah, and I think the directing was really great, so... Yeah, yeah I loved a lot of the visuals in this episode. Definitely. Uh, let's talk about what happened this week. Shadow has been imprisoned in a futuristic torture machine by Mr. Town. At the diner, the gods split up to get shit done. Jin and Salim head off on motorcycle, Anansi and Wednesday ride away in his Cadillac Betty, and Laura and Sweeney steal a car to track down Shadow. On Mr. Town's train, Shadow is forced to recall his childhood. Moving from France to the United States as a teen, having trouble with bullies in his new neighborhood, and his mother dying of cancer. Laura and Sweeney are stopped by cows and car trouble, then take a shortcut through Sweeney's horde. They attack the guards and find Shadow. At the same time, Mr. Wednesday has parked his car Betty on the railroad tracks, dedicates her sacrifice to her rebirth, and watches as the train destroys her. So one of the things that I was thinking about for this episode after I watched it the first time um, was that in a way what we're getting in the flashbacks is Shadow's coming to America story. Um, Mm. And like, yes, he was born here, but it seems like when he moved away, he was so young that, you know, all he really knows is life abroad. He doesn't remember it very well. Um, And so, like, given, you know, the rest of the context of the show um, and all of the other Coming to America segments for the different gods, um, I thought it was interesting to think about it that way. Um, And also, part of me was like, I kind of wish that they had done some sort of actual like that they had actually explicitly labeled it a coming to america story even though you know it's it's different for him than it is for the gods but um i don't know i just thought there's some like cool parallelism there no that's awesome i hadn't thought of that at all but you're totally right kind of along those lines um you know even though he's a human and not a god being brought there um you know being created by worship I thought it was interesting that, like, as, you know, he's coming into the port of New York, um, he and his mom are sitting and looking at the Statue of Liberty and speaking about her in, like, a very reverent and, like, almost religious way. Yeah. It would have been interesting if Liberty as a goddess actually existed as a character 
Um, and I was like trying to figure out how she would fit in with the new gods and the old gods. And it's kind of, it's interesting because um, it's kind of like halfway in between, right? Mm-hmm. Liberty, the goddess, is not necessarily explicitly religious in the same way that like media and technology and like surveillance, they're not religious, but they do, um, you know, like create worship and human attention. Um, right. But, but you know, liberty, I don't know. I feel like li- the goddess Liberty would kind of be halfway between the new gods and the old gods. Um, she's kind of abstract in the same way that the new gods are, but also she's like not tied to technology and modernism in the same way that they are. Yeah. What What is Liberty like in modern times versus like the enlightenment era idea of Liberty you know, that it literally has that statue. And then, you know, like the even older Roman goddess that Shadow refers to that kind of has like a similar name. Yeah. And if, you know, it's like if human attention and reverence like creates new media as a god, like why doesn't human reverence and attention create liberty as a goddess? Because like Lord knows we like worship the fuck out of that all the time <laughs> in America. <laughs> I, or or do we like we've kind of taken our eye off of that ball in a way or or it gets used as um you know like the statue of liberty or the idea of liberty kind of gets used as a a screen to be like you know like oh yeah we're down with liberty and and that means like Google is watching you uh cuz free <laughs> enterprise or yeah. you know No, I mean It definitely gets perverted and twisted. Mm -hmm. Um, So, like, you could imagine that there could be, like, two liberties, two liberty goddesses in the same way that there's a gaggle of Jesuses. Right. Um, (laughs) Right. But there is at least, you know, some real reverence and then some lip service reverence. Yeah, she, I mean, the idea of liberty has been here since uh, season one, episode one, with that coin flip that Mm -hmm. shadow cheats and and you see that liberty uh head on there and then the coin that he has from the zariah sister is a liberty coin like you said it's really central to american identity his mother says that she's been doing the work of spreading her message of you know liberty because um and they don't say this but there's nothing that contradicts it what we find out about shadow's mother in the book is that she is in the bureaucracy of ambassadors so she's like an assistant to an ambassador like a secretary Mm -hmm. um and so that's why he's been overseas but is like a united states citizen and stuff Um, i see so if you're if you're born to american citizens while they're you know abroad doing official business you're still an American citizen, like John McCain or whatever was born in right. Panama. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and she's been literally working for liberty the way that she says, mm-hmm. you know, the idea of liberty. And she seems like so sharp and so smart about exactly who she is and what she's doing. That like this is clearly like she's thought about this and this is why she's doing the work that she's so passionate about, um, Mm -hmm. despite being a single mother and all that. So watching the show, I did get just kind of like an impression that maybe one of the reasons why she left was because she didn't really like the way that black people were treated in America. And she kind of was trying to escape that on some level and Mm -hmm. go someplace like better or different. But yeah, that kind of doesn't quite gel with the idea of her as like a government employee. But yeah, I mean, maybe she's just really aware of kind of like the American promise and how it simultaneously fails to live up to that promise and just like trying to do better. Yeah. It's hard to tell exactly what's happening here in terms of why she has come back. I mean, they're very explicit about showing the twin towers in the background to give us like, this is pre nine 11, presumably sometime in the nineties, given like the boom box that we see and stuff like that. And so I'm trying to like 
get an idea. Like, I, I don't know if American Gods exactly has the same, you know, presidents and all that kind of stuff. But maybe this is, you've got like, you know, Reagan and Bush. This could be like around that time era. And maybe she was politically speaking like, oh, we no longer need your services, Miss Democrat, Black Democrat. Please come home and uh, figure out a job, you know. Or maybe Clinton got elected and she thought that that would this is time make to a bigger home. difference. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not, they don't say what it is, but whatever, you know, she comes back to America and the timing is kind of like terrible in a way. Uh, she gets sick real fast. I'm not sure how old Shadow is now, but in the previous episode, Anansi said to him something like, <laughs> When you take a man's measurements, you get a bill for his life expenses. Little Shadow Moon was a shrimpy little kid. Roughed around on the block until what? 14, you put on two feet and 60 pounds? 15. Still 15 on the inside, don't you, boy? (laughs) And so I feel like this is the 15-year-old Shadow that we were talking about last Mm -hmm. week. He's really big for a 15-year-old. But I guess he said he, like, you know, kind of hit puberty all at once. Right. In a way, I feel like Shadow has been stuck here. And what I kept thinking about when I watched this part of the story was this whole idea of, like, his relationship to Liberty in the first season and how this kind of, like, makes all of that more rich because this is was like his mom's thing and his mom had all this faith that he talked to Laura about you know when they were together like yeah my mom was a believer mm-hmm. she believed in Jesus I guess because of the way that this story ends um, with her in a church in the coffin exactly the way that Laura was in a church in a coffin Mm-hmm. You know, the Statue of Liberty, but also he's sitting there with the Liberty coin. Shadow was at Laura's funeral with a coin and then goes to the grave and like flips the coin on it. Like, I feel like this trauma of his mother's death is directly tied to Laura and how all of like the, her death reawakened this trauma of his mother and losing the only woman in his life and his only connection to happiness, home safety, like all of these feelings were just crushed again. And this is kind of like the landscape that shadow has been inhabiting for all of season one and up till now, but we didn't understand it until this episode. You know, I didn't actually pick out, that parallelism but that is one of my favorite things about the episode overall it does that in a couple different ways that I did pick out sort of like drawing visual comparisons and thematic comparisons between different uh events so like there's the the coin flip right before his mom's death where like the coin um Mm, hits the ground and then shatters um, and then there's the second coin flip when Laura comes up and rescues him f- with Mr. Town. And so it's kind of like two chance events that end up with different results. And then we see Shadow intervening um, when that neighborhood boy was getting beat up. And then Laura intervening when he's being tortured. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I guess the death of Laura and the death of his mom are another one of those like very strong comparisons. I guess I didn't necessarily pick it out because Laura's death isn't explicitly in this episode, but it kind of is doing the same thing on a bigger scale. Yeah, I think so because like I couldn't help but think of it when he's in the church by himself. And then I think back to him going into the church where everybody knows that she died because she was having sex with her boyfriend Mm -hmm. in the car and how he's so alone in that church, even though it's filled with people who were there for Laura and how everybody wants him to not be there. 
because he just makes things awkward. Yeah. <laughs> and so when he was a kid, he was there like literally alone. There's like this final moment where he's kind of staring at that image of Jesus. And then this anger kind of moves through his eyes. And he, you feel like the, a part of him closes off. Like, I, I don't believe in anything anymore because you took her from me. Well, and yet he's praying in that moment. I actually read that as him opening up to faith for the first time. Interesting. Because we don't see him exhibiting any faith before that moment. And he seems like very unsure of himself um, and kind of like unsure of being in that church. But then he kind of just like surrenders and starts actually praying you know through desperation or whatever that's like how a lot of people end up being um or like finding religion Mm -hmm. right is is through grief and desperation again like given the context of the whole show i saw this episode as like oh this is the first time that shadow is praying and actually contributing like faith to the faith economy um his like (laughs) start as a battery so again, there's that scene where he's in the waiting room at the the clinic where his mom is getting, you know, diagnosed or treated or whatever. And um, he gets his first coin and kind of learns his first coin trick um, from somebody whose voice we hear, but we don't actually see. And actually, I was curious, it didn't sound like the same voice that Ian McShane is doing as Wednesday, but I think it's kind of implied that that actually maybe is Wednesday, and so this is, like, the first influence of Wednesday on Shadow's life, um, sending him down that kind of, like, I'm not exactly grifter, but, like, illusion Mm -hmm. uh, trick pathway. So it's, like, his first coin, his first coin trick, and then his first exhibition of faith. Interesting. Did you think that was Wednesday? Uh, I mean, I think it's someone I don't know. Like, yeah, it's definitely doesn't sound like uh, Mr. Wednesday. Yeah. And it's not like just some dude who's handing yeah. out coins. Like there's obviously like a lot of significance going on there. And I think the show is actively like inviting us to speculate about who that person is. The show is making an ex- explicit connection between the coins his faith and this um, isolation that he's going through. And, and I really think that those coins are tied to the idea of Liberty. His mother is just so ardent about the idea of Liberty. He is kind of playing with it, right? He's kind of Mm -hmm. like learning to do tricks with it. And that's sort of what being a con man is. That's, you know, like you're playing with your identity. You're playing with, the freedom that America gives you to appear to be one thing, but actually you're another so that you can take what you want and you don't um, actually participate in a way that's authentic with people and vulnerable and open. When shadow starts out in that flashback, he is open and vulnerable and sensitive and thoughtful. Mm -hmm. And by the end of the flashback, I feel like he's very closed off and, has given himself to violence. You know, we, in our other podcast, Hallowed Ground Storycast, we talked about in the Crouching Tiger, a Hidden Dragon episode about how action scenes, when they're done well, should explore the emotional space of the character. And I feel Mm -hmm. like that scene that you mentioned where he goes to save the kid who's getting beat up by the bullies is a perfect example of that. He starts out doing one thing, and then at a certain point, he gives himself over to the violence of what's happening, and the person that he's helping is even afraid of him by the end of it. Yeah. When he calls Laura from prison, like, he's proud that he's read a book. But at this point, he's, like, an avid reader. And so, like, just a part of him is closed off, and and it's something that started to open back up with Laura, but then it closed off again. It's just weird how they bring us to this point where we get all this vulnerability about Shadow and his backstory because I feel like it has nothing to do with what's actually happening to him. 
like, I don't know if Mr. Town is actually interested in any of this information or if it's being extracted from him or if Shadow is going into these memories to try and avoid the torture that's happening to him. Like, it's it's all pretty weird, I think. Mm-hmm. I don't know. What do you think about that? Do you think, like, the violence that's happening to him is making him thinking about these bullies and the violence they did to him? Like, what's the connection here? Yeah, so I think the most direct connection is just that, the violence that he experienced and perpetrated in his past being tied to, like, his current torture. Like, the larger narrative significance is it's trying to say something about Shadow as, um, like, a more passive versus active person so like one of the things that we complained about so much uh last season was that shadow is such a passive character like so much of what happens is just like stuff happening to him and not him making active choices and that's not something that the show necessarily invented like it's a little bit of a problem inherited from the book and it's something that i think is less of a problem in a novel than in a TV show. Yeah, I guess the real, like, thematic narrative comparison that I saw between the flashbacks and the current story was not necessarily the current story in this episode, but more, like, the current broader story. You know, Shadow has just been, like, passive and passive and passive and reacting and not taking action. And then in the flashbacks, we kind of see... A little bit of an explanation for why he is the way he is and we see that like yeah he's always been kind of a sensitive passive optimistic kind of guy who just like you know tries to be nice to people and thinks that things will work out for him if he does that Um, and then he ends up being sorely disappointed Um, and then it shows us this moment in the past where he did become active and fight back um and so we haven't seen a whole lot of that from shadow in the present story yet but i see it as kind of foreshadowing for what's coming next right so like the first part of the of the flashback um relates to what we've seen in the current story so far where shadow is just kind of like being buffeted around and super passive and And, you know, like, as TV show viewers, we've been kind of, like, waiting for Shadow to, like, take initiative and, and, like, have some agency and, like, make a choice and, like, actually do something that impacts the narrative. I mean, again, I haven't read the book past where we are in the TV show, but I think it's kind of foreshadowing that hopefully Shadow is going to um, become more active and start making choices that matter and actually, like, fight back and really embrace the war, right? Because, like, so far, he's kind of, he's chosen to believe in Wednesday, you know, he's, like, become a believer in some respects and, like, gained faith, but he hasn't really joined the battle as a super active participant. No, I think you're right. That's really smart. That's a really smart read on the, on that we're kind of seeding the ground here for Shadow's next step. Yeah, and so that's why... I really liked the flashbacks overall, but I felt like there are a lot of kind of misleading aspects of it that didn't really gel together. All the stuff about like him knowing the truth of who he is and him being super different and having like the light inside him. I feel like that was trying to have like a larger thematic resonance and I just like didn't really get what it was trying to do or it didn't I didn't feel like it was saying anything because it it didn't resonate with the present story particularly you know like I guess if you're really reaching at straws you can say that he has a light within him that Laura can see because he is literally a beacon for her right um but given that she's the only one who sees it and that strikes me as coincidental and and like not actually resonating thematically I don't know. I just don't see anything in the current story of like shadow and truth telling or like knowing the truth. He seems like, again, yeah, like very passive and kind of open to anything, but like not actually trusting his gut or having a strong gut instinct for the truth in any meaningful way. 
I mean, I liked the way that they were building the relationship between him and his mom, because I think that, that, like, him being strongly connected to his mom shapes him as a character, and I like what that does. Um, but in terms of, like, all of the symbolic stuff that his mom was actually talking about, I was just kind of like, eh. It, fe- it feels like it's supposed to amount to something, and then when it doesn't, it just leaves you feeling, like, confused. Yeah, you say reaching for straws, and, like, this is kind of, like, the original, like, whole pitch that I had to you of, like, you're the scully to my molder, because, like, <laughs> because, like, that is the straw that I am, like, holding on to, where I see this connection between Laura and his mother, because they both see the light in him, and, uh, and they but both... But Laura, but Laura didn't before she died. Right, that's what I mean, like... Oh, that she yeah, that his mother died and it crushed him and Laura died. And now she sees him the way that his mother did. But it's like all broken, like he can't love her now. It's like his vulnerability and um, trauma over his mother has like come back to him and he can't ignore it now because like Laura, I mean, this is like what ghosts are in a story. This is what what the dead, the living dead are in stories. They, they are a reminder of these things that happened to us in the past. And that is kind of like what Laura symbolizes. I think where he's like, Oh, I can't, I messed up in this way. And, and uh, I can't, you like, you love me. I can't love you back. And I lost you and it all hurts too much. And, um, like, I just see that connection being drawn narratively there. It's not super strong, like you say. I guess I just feel like if Shadow really has a light inside him, someone should be able to see it besides Laura, you know? But, like, he's so... Before he meets Laura, he's so isolated um, socially, you know? And, I th- again, like, that was something that I actually appreciated about the flashback is I think it kind of explains like, why Shadow doesn't really have friends. Mm -hmm. You know, like, the only friends we see him have, he meets through Laura. Right. You know, Robbie and Audrey are her friends. I like what you're saying about it seeding the ground for his coming agency, because I think that will be happening uh, in the next couple of episodes if they are going close to the book. But, yeah, like, it's the flashback as well done as it is just sits uncomfortably with this story and like everything that we've had before it even though I think it enriches a lot of the symbolism and imagery and like character of shadow (laughs) well so it's funny that like I think you buy some of the attempted symbolism more than I do but you're more negative on how it functions overall than I am. Yeah. (laughs) I think it works on kind of an intuitive level, right? Just like he's being tortured in the present. He was being, having physical pain inflicted on him in the past. Um, And you have like a note here written in our, our planning doc about how him surviving the torture in the present, right? It's like involves, you know, compartmentalizing emotional pain and physical pain in a way that is reflected in the flashbacks. And so, I don't know, I think it kind of, it works on an intuitive level. Um, It's just when you're like trying to think medium hard about it, it doesn't really come together. And then I guess maybe if you think extra hard, then it works again. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, I mean, part of it is we just don't have very much information and the show is very serialized. So I'm curious what Mr. Town's goal is. He doesn't mm-hmm. seem to have like a well-defined goal. He talks to Shadow. He's he, like he wants to know why Shadow does what he does, but I'm not sure if he actually wants to know that or if he wants to make Shadow upset by asking about that. These nodes are like on his head. Are they pulling these memories out of his mind somehow like some super science is going on here or is it just electrocuting him and uh and and it's just pain i'm too fuzzy about everything that's happening 
in the in the torture to understand the significance of the flashback itself. You know, it never really occurred to me that the the electrodes might be doing anything more than just like causing him physical pain. But like, maybe they are just designed to like pull out some of your most painful memories. And so that's why it's pulling out like his moments of emotional turmoil and physical pain. Yeah, I mean, like, besides the fact that he's trapped in the giant um, Chinese finger trap, as my wife said when we were watching it together. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff here that I'm like, oh, I, I can make all these connections, but like, that's what I do. And and it's not that the show is like uh, necessarily serving up interesting connections that feel like they're on purpose or deeply meaningful. And so like how much of the work am I doing for the show and, um, and how much, is is the show setting things up that just haven't paid off yet so I'm confused. I don't know. I think it felt it feels pretty intentional and the payoff is at least reasonable. I mean, it's powerful. I really like this story that that is set in here. I don't want it to sound like I didn't enjoy the episode. I I really did the and the performances are fantastic. We're going to get into the side stories here really quick, but before we leave this part of the of the whole thing uh, I did want to talk about in the backstory I, I found like a problematic element of um, like respectability politics mm-hmm. um, and I'm not like an expert on this I feel like you are way more politically informed than I am uh, which is funny because I didn't see this at all and so and then okay. when you pointed it out I was like oh well I guess maybe I did but then I was just so more confused about other things. And so that was like where my brain energy went. Right. Um, but yeah, but, I like couldn't quite articulate it in the way that, that you're about to. We'll see. Don't give me too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I felt like there's the moment where um, Shadow is exploring New York and um, and we get a little bit of black on black violence and it just I was like, oh, are we doing respectability politics? Are we saying that like Shadow is the good one? Like he's the sensitive, smart black kid and he doesn't deserve to be discriminated against like these other kids who um, are thugs, who wear gold chains, who are like kind of cliche. They got the giant boom box. They listen to black music, you know, all this stuff respectability politics is like all about this idea that you have to rise to this standard that white people just get to have for free, no matter what their behavior is. And if you are good enough, then you can be treated like a human being. But if you are somehow like exhibiting, you know, kind of quote unquote, black culture tendencies, then you don't, you deserve to be brutalized by the police the way that Shadow is, to be the enemy of the culture and all this stuff. I felt like this was a weak decision on the writer's part to get us to sympathize with Shadow, to have him discriminated against on every side by invoking this idea. Like this, this is not the direction that I want the show to go with this issue. So first off, I want to say that I'm really interested to see what Junita Davis has to say about this. Me too. Because <laughs> um, I think she is going to be way more insightful um, and obviously have a more informed perspective than either you or I could have. Uh, she's a writer for Black Girl Nerds and someone who um, whose critique and analysis uh we leaned on pretty strongly during season one. So I hope she's going to be covering season two as well. I read it less about respectability politics and more about Shadow being an outsider in the way that it's actually executed in the show. He doesn't really do anything to rub them the wrong way. He's just walking there in the park. Mm -hmm. And, And I thought that that was actually kind of poorly executed. I thought it would have been better for him to make some sort of mistake that maybe like he didn't understand like a social custom or like know about some standard of behavior um and so he could like transgress and then get 
speed up. Another thought that I had about this topic is that, so in the book, Shadow is not obviously Black. He's more ethnically ambiguous, and people are constantly trying to, like, figure out what he is. Is he Native American? Is he Black? Like, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. And, like, it felt like there was some sort of thematic thing happening, again, about, like, him being an outsider. I don't know. It's problematic, but, like, maybe it kind of fits in that way. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. No, I definitely think the episode is making that idea explicit that when you're a little bit of everybody, then you're not a part of anyone. Mm -hmm. There's a tribalism in America. And I think it's good to bring that up. And I I like that part that, you know, just based on his skin color, he is getting attacked from all sides. Like that's America. Yeah. If we're going to bring up that, like we should at least mention the idea of like, in this case, Shadow is, like, getting beat up because he's lighter-skinned, but, like, typically within the Black community, the lighter-skinned you are, actually, like, the more privilege and power um, you have would Beyonce be Beyonce if she was darker-skinned? You know, there's, like, a lot of, um, a lot of, like, discrimination within the community that actually happens the opposite way. (laughs) I guess I didn't frame it as respectability politics, but I was like, oh, are they really going like trying to present the idea that like New York in the nineties was so bad and dangerous that like, you know, a light skinned black kid walking around would just get like beat up for not belonging to the neighborhood. Yeah. And so I kind of thought it was playing into stereotypes. I don't know exactly what to say about it. Other than that, I can see why it makes you uncomfortable. And it also, it made me a little bit uncomfortable, even if I like didn't quite see it as, shadow being the one respectable exception to the rule yeah i just felt like it was a way to get our sympathy for shadow like the like the writer just basically has this problem i need to invest the sympathy of the audience with shadow how do i do that and then leans on the framework of respectability politics to kind of illustrate that like shadow's the good one and which is contrasted by these are the bad ones and also the police are bad because they have misunderstood who is the good one and who is the bad one and it's like no don't stop it stop (laughs) it would have been better to see him just like maybe try and fail to make friends and like people think he's weird because like teenagers like all teenagers of all races are shitheads yeah and like if they had had a chance to make to have it like more slowly escalate to physical violence i think it could have worked better and been more realistic and felt less like they were leaning on negative stereotypes of black people as just like thugs yeah this story is really um pretty well told but there's just oversights that are, are are in there and this is one of them it doesn't ruin it it's just something that i noticed and then I feel like you got to pull that stuff out and talk about it to kind of like, I don't want to ignore something like that, you know, in in our discussion. No, and especially in a show like this where it's like explicitly thinking about and trying to explore like racial dynamics and racial stereotypes. Yeah. To move away here uh, from Shadow a little bit. And, uh, you know, I've already mentioned Laura a few times in this episode. I'm trying to get a beat on where Laura is at. Like, I feel like last season she made this uh, kind of arc from being like someone with no emotional connections or empathy to by the end, she's like friends with no strings attached to Salim. She's kind of buddies with Mad Sweeney. I mean, sort of like she lifts him up by his nuts at the end. But, you know whatever. Uh, And now here she's going after shadow after he has rejected her again. There's been weirdness between them. And I know that shadow's in trouble and that she feels this pull to him, but it's like, why is this happening? Like it doesn't feel well motivated to me. And Sweeney goes along. I get it because of his coin, but also Sweeney had the coin back and gave it back to her. So why is he going with her? I feel like it's this idea of we got to get back to the book and this happens in the book. So I got to go save shadow because of book. 
And that's not a good reason. Okay, let me see if I can fix this for you a little bit. All right. I feel like Laura goes after Shadow because he's in immediate physical peril. I think if he had just wandered away from her and like explicitly rejected her and then left, then maybe she wouldn't have chased after him so emphatically. But like he was legit kidnapped Mm -hmm. and she's already saved him from the new gods once. And so I kind of feel like it's actually completely consistent with her character that she's just really worried for his safety and sees herself as his protector. Then, like, why does she give up when they get to a dead end road? Uh, Because she's just, I don't know, have you never gotten to that place where you just, like, lose all hope and then give up and lie in a field of flowers oh, for I mean, like 10 that... minutes while you're regrouping? <laughs> That's, like, my place. I, I live in that place, but... <laughs> I get it, but I don't don't know. I saw it as completely believable that she would have been like going after him 110% and then like when her plan failed, just be like, fuck, I need some time to like regroup and like going with Sweeney through the horde. We're going through the horde. I actually, I kind of liked it because it like, it's a little bit out of nowhere, but it does fit in with the overall mythology of the show. As far as like why Sweeney is tagging along with her, trying to get his coin back, I don't think Laura knows that she was dead. Like dead, dead. Um, right. And that he reanimated her. And so like obviously he felt really guilty about his culpability in causing her original human death. You know, he still does want his coin back, but he, he just has to wait for her to either like finish her quest in some way or like actually completely fall apart where it's like him taking the coin back isn't the difference between her succeeding or failing you know he has to feel like he's not the one really killing her the second time right and also i think they've he's you know a lot of his uh you know talking shit to her is a little bit of bravado and like him lying to her and lying to himself because he doesn't want to acknowledge the fact that he's actually grown fond of her. I know like there are some Laura Sweeney shippers out there um, and you kind of question like, is this a romance that they're building between them? Yeah. I don't, I don't see it as a romance. I see it as like, it's a platonic love story to me. Okay. I think that's what they're doing, and I really like it. So, I yeah, I I can see <laughs> what you're saying. the The only reason that I think about the romance angle, I mean, besides, I know there's a million shippers, is because like the, they have this brief little exchange where he talks about, you know, she's like, I don't know what kind of syphilitic culture spawned leprechauns, but where <laughs> I'm from, you don't get killed for infidelity. And and he's like, well, where I'm from, it's the worst sin to betray your beloved, which immediately made me think of Essie and how I said mm-hmm. that they had like this supernatural love story that, you know, wasn't about sex, but was about this fidelity that they had for each other. And so I'm like, oh, is this like, are we starting to bridge that gap between those two characters in his mind? Is he or is this just like like you said, they're close friends. And so when you're vulnerable with those people, those are like the biggest fights, right? The people you're closest with are are like the ones that you scream at each other. Yeah. No, I definitely think that the show is trying to draw that SE Laura comparison on purpose. And I think they are intermingled in Sweeney's mind. And I think that's part of the reason why he likes her so much, even though he really doesn't want to. Mm -hmm. Um, I did love the part where she takes off his handcuffs. That was good. I really um, like that. Because it's like, yeah, it like it really, I think, builds their relationship and also uh, is like such a good piece of continuity, right? Because like it would be so easy to just forget that he's supposed to be wearing handcuffs. That was like four or five episodes ago and like literally over two years ago. Right, right. You know, we would not have noticed if suddenly he just wasn't wearing handcuffs anymore. Um, but like the costume team and the writers are like clearly keeping an eye on all of that stuff very carefully so i thought that was awesome 
Oh no, that's fabulous. It was, and also like in that same vein was the whole thing with Salim that you pointed out last season. And I was so excited when that came up in this episode that I texted you right away. I was like, Oh my God, he's, he doesn't have his prayer rug. He's using a cardboard box or something to do yeah. his prayer on. And I was like, Oh, that's great. <laughs> so the other thing that I had a problem with in this episode, a much bigger problem with is that the longer that we see Mr. Wednesday and Anansi together, like the less I buy this partnership and friendship in the previous episode, Mr. Wednesday like pushes his buttons about other gods who have shown up who are all black. Oh, John Henry. Right. Yeah. Any Br'er Rabbit. And he's like, no, no, no. So he's like clearly provoking him on the issue that makes him the most upset, which is something that friends do. I don't know. It just feels more hostile to me. It feels like Anansi really doesn't like it. And the fried chicken thing is like a line too far where I'm like, okay, I'm, I actually don't buy this anymore. Yeah. The fried chicken thing just felt like super out of character that he would either be like that dumb or that brazen, you know, for a guy who's on his side. I have no argument counter to you in this instance. (laughs) I also did not like it. (laughs) I did laugh at what Orlando Jones was doing in that scene. And like, it was delightful. His performance is great. So I did like the whole uh, sacrificing his car at the end, which is like clearly a reference to sacrificing a horse, right? Because like there's a horse neighing sound effect as the car explodes. Oh, I didn't catch Um, that. That's Oh, yeah. So there's... There's a a horse neighing as the car explodes. And also, um, so like specifically sacrifice of horses is like a big thing in Norse mythology and like ancient Norse culture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when I was watching with my roommate, that was like even before the car got hit and we heard the horse noise, he was like, oh, Odin sacrificing his horse, like obviously. Um, And so I was curious how much you knew about Sleepnir. Yeah, uh, it's like he's writing death, kind of, um, because Mm -hmm. Odin is like a god of death. The way that his sacrifices work is about like hanging people and Slipnir is the vehicle for that, like literally in a way. Yeah, so like Odin sacrifices his own eye at one point to get like wisdom and he hangs himself from the tree And then there's this whole thing in Norse culture about sacrificing your horses. And so Odin is sacrificing Betty, a.k.a. Sleepnir, his eight-legged horse. And so my roommate, who who was like, identified that immediately, is really into Norse mythology. And so he told me a little bit about the story of Sleepnir. And like, it's kind of crazy. Um, Oh, that would be Norse mythology for you. Yeah. So do you know the story about how Sleepnir came to be? Uh, I am not pulling it up in my mind. Okay. Okay. So (laughs) basically, give you the TLDR version. There's this like giant creature who offered to build a wall in a certain amount of time and like had this bet with the gods that if he didn't do it, he would get the wall for free. And if he did do it, then he would sleep with all of their wives. Um, And so when it became clear that he was going to win the bet, like Loki transforms into a really like sexy mare to seduce the giant's horse, um, which was like the reason why he was able to get the work done so quickly is because his horse was so strong and powerful. Mm-hmm. Um, so Loki seduces his stallion um, and gets impregnated. Um, and so is able by like stealing away the horse is able to prevent him from building the wall in time. So uh, they won on that front, but then Loki actually gets pregnant and then gives birth to Sleepnir, the eight-legged horse. Um, (laughs) So (laughs) Loki is the original, uh, like, male pregnancy story. (laughs) Yeah, there's a lot of that in Norse mythology, to be honest with you. Um, Loki gets pregnant with all of the creatures that will be the downfall of all of the gods. Nice. (laughs) So, like, the world serpent is his child. If you've seen uh, Thor 
Ragnarok, uh, the, mm-hmm. l- the Marvel movie. Like yeah. the, the giant wolf, that's his baby. Um, oh, oh. The actual antagonist of that movie, uh, Hell, is his baby. Um, yeah, I had not made the connection to Slipnir. This is fascinating to me. Uh, he's talking about like you're going to be a berserker, you're going to come back and um, and all of that stuff. And I'm like, oh, cool. Are we going to get a berserker on the show? That, that would be interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I hadn't thought about the horse. That would be wild to have him riding around on a horse that's going to be pretty <laughs> conspicuous well i don't know if betty will come back as a literal horse but at least like the connection is there you should definitely go back and and just re-listen to like the last 10 seconds because there's definitely horse noises so like there's this idea there right that something is going to come out of this sacrifice right and we begin the episode with the same idea, like you asked uh, in our last podcast about what's going to happen now that Zariah Vechenyaya is dead. Mm -hmm. And they start out by talking about, there's going to be a new star born and we need to like get it to make sure that the beast in the sky stays where it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's this idea in this episode about rebirth and reincarnation that the gods experience. It seems like, killing them in their physical form is not the end of them it's just like a reset button i guess maybe yeah and we seem to see that also with media and the technical boy you know it's it's interesting i felt like you almost forget that technical boys even in this episode you know he's like asking some kind of interesting questions about like what is art what is the role of art what is the nature of art but you like really barely have time to absorb or think about any of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't really have any thoughts on that other than that. I think it's an interesting set of questions. This makes me go back to the lessons of Lonnie Diane Rich when she says in her series, How Story Works, that when you know the ending of a story, you know what it means. The universe kind of recurs in Hinduism. It's on a cycle where it is created and then preserved and then destroyed and then restarts. But it's not a circle exactly. It's more like a spiral because each time there is variation, there is differences. And so in Hinduism, when you get the beginning, middle and end of the universe, then you know the meaning of what all of that was And then when you get another universe, you can compare the two of them and these universes and their meanings kind of stack on top of each other, like poetry, like rhyming with each other, but also different than each other. And a lot of meaning and richness emerges from that in the way that this show is adapted from a book and the differences between the show and the book say something about the intentions of the authors and the meaning of the story. When we get media reincarnated, she will be different and that will mean something. You know, the differences between those characters. Uh, Mm -hmm. And the same thing with Laura. She came back from the dead and the differences between when she was alive and now that she's back from the dead have meaning because, uh, you know, like it, there's a comparison there and the gaps and the what is the same and what is different uh, speaks to something essential about Laura and also about what is changeable or mutable in her. And so like all of that was kind of on my mind with this episode in terms of him like sacrificing his car and Zariah possibly coming back and media coming back. Like it seems to be a theme probably for the season that is starting to be brought up here. So I wanted to like introduce the idea of reincarnation and what it means early on. So maybe we can talk about it more when we see it in future episodes. Also, I, I can't believe that this is the first time we're mentioning Lonnie because this whole episode is built on flashbacks. Right. And I think it's actually like a really beautiful illustration of, of her whole point of like flashbacks in general are not used well and are usually really bad. But when they are used well, it's when they tell a full complete story in the past um, that is also saying something about the story in the present. And I think this episode 
is a really good example of actually doing that effectively. What you're saying like makes me think of Lost, which actually does the whole thing better than this because like they're very intentionally making two stories that resonate with each other in exactly the way that I'm saying in Lost, it is textually talking about reincarnation, about being a new person, um, but being the same person. And what was the same about you in the past and what is different about you now? Uh, and it compares those two experiences every episode with a different character each episode. It's really fascinating. Like it's a masterclass in how to do a flashback story comparing this episode to lost is not doesn't do any favors for this episode but um <laughs> but i i do think you're exactly right about like lonnie would i think say that the flashback in this was um well done so the last main thing i think we should probably hit on is the the scenes with bill quiss and mr worlds especially since we used uh the quote from that as our opening <laughs> Yeah. What is he doing? Like, is he, is he seducing Bill Quiss? Like, in, not in like a sexual way, but like, doesn't he already have power over her? Like, I'm confused by this. Since she's using cell phones to get on Tinder and, and get her, her worship. Yeah. I feel uh, like she's on their team. Like, what is even going on? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess not knowing how she fits into the, the rest of the plot it's hard to say. Um, but I, you know, I just saw it as sort of like, she's caught in between both teams. And he's trying to get her more fully on board team new God. And she's like, very clearly resisting that. And um, yeah, I don't know exactly what role she'll play. But she's still a wild card. And maybe leaning slightly towards team old God. Yeah, maybe. I, I like that he points out to her that if you don't pick a side when there's a war going on, that you will be torn apart. Like that is, I think, a politically relevant message in our times. Yeah. You know, about centrism. Is there something about the idea that love is the most important weapon in war? I mean, I love that line and and the idea is like really evocative. I'm not sure what it means, you know, like. Yeah, I mean, I guess if you go back to, I don't know, I want to say something about like Helen of Troy. I love like, it. Lo love starting a war. I don't know. <laughs> it's so good. You're like bringing up the Iliad and slip near like what is happening in this episode? It's great. I don't know. We're just a topsy turvy world. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, there's like all of the like, Cold War femme fatale spy mm, thing, maybe. Yeah. Um, and then being a Texan, the Yellow Rose of Texas, how Texas won the War of Independence for Mexico. I think it's a total myth. But the legend goes that like the the head general Santa Ana was, um, sleeping with a prostitute in the camp and that's when they like surrounded and and snuck up on him and got him to surrender oh uh yep that's what two full years of texas history will leave you with <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know i i like that bill quiz is important um mm -hmm. i want more for that character and so i hope that she like continues yeah in the book, she's just a one-off, right? Like, you see her coming to America story and that's it? Or does she come back? I mean, th yeah, the scene that we get in the first season uh, is, like, really close to the book. And then uh, she does come back near the end of the book, but not in any significant way that matters. Okay. But when you've got Yatide Badakai, like, gotta use her. Oh, definitely. Yeah, I love uh, how Bilquist has become important and yeah, I, and she's like a wild card in the plot to me. So I'm interested in this. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> like, yeah. It sounds good. Uh, yeah. And I wish there was more of it. And speaking of confusing things, who is the beguiling man that this episode is named after? I mean, it's clearly the djinn. It's clearly <laughs> like him on his motorcycle. His his. 15 seconds of fame in the parking lot really oh my god it's so good though 
Oh, they're so cute when he gets in the little sidecar. He's so oh. happy. Like, that smile on his face is precious. It's so good. Yeah. I don't know. There's not a good answer to that. I don't know if the Beguiling Man is a reference to something. I can't think of anything from the book that that could be referencing or if it's like a poem that I'm not remembering or who knows. Like, I, is it Shadow? Is it Mr. Town? I don't know. If you, listener, know who the Beguiling Man is or have a theory, please let us know either via Twitter or email details at the end. Okay, so I think now that we're done, uh, let's wrap up with lowlights and highlights. Alan, what was your least favorite part? I I mean, I complained about this already, but Laura and Sweeney just feel off-brand to me. I just don't know what they're doing. And yeah, I just feel like pressure from the book is making this happen. What stuck out to you? Uh, Well, strong disagree. I like the Laura (laughs) Sweeney plotline. Um... But I think you'll be backing me up on my least favorite part. That fried chicken joke was just so bad. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what's your favorite part? Uh, I mean, we never gave any credit, but um, Gabriel Darku plays young Shadow in this, and he, he is just amazing. I think he did such an incredible job uh, with what was written for him and the chemistry mm-hmm. that he had with uh, Olonike Adali who plays uh, his mother is just like, it's so strong. It's really the best thing about the episode, I think. And uh, I just love all the ways that it it makes all these connections between shadow and Laura and uh, even like shadow and Wednesday and like the, the whole Liberty thing and just all that stuff is really fascinating, but it all works for me to the degree that it does because of those two actors and the chemistry that they had with each other. Uh, what was your favorite thing? I totally agree um, that that those two new actors on the show were amazing um, and like make the episode work. My favorite part, I think, is that even though some of the the themes from the flashback about truth telling and authenticity and light don't really gel perfectly, um, I really loved the use of the visual symbols um, and like the overall approach to theme in this episode. So like I loved the two coin flips, the violence being mirrored in the past and the present, um, the like intervention um, to like break up the violence and perpetuate different violence. Yeah, and I liked I like that we get to see Baby Shadow's first coin and first coin trick and <laughs> what I interpreted to be his first time p- praying. So it, they're just like, I really love what this episode does to kind of flesh out and build uh, more of Shadow's character, um, drawing connections between the past and the present and like the visual symbols. Awesome. Yeah, me too. Before we sign off this week, we want to let you know about a new podcast from our good friends, Lonnie Diane Rich and Dr. Kelly Jones over at Chipperish Media. Um, If you're a big fan of Neil Gaiman and American Gods, uh, you might also be a fan of his book that he co-wrote with Terry Pratchett called Good Omens. Um, And of course, you probably know that there's a Good Omens TV show coming out very soon and (laughs) potentially... Neil Gaiman working really hard as showrunner on Good Omens had some not so great effects on uh, the behind the scenes drama over at American Gods, but that's fine. <laughs> we don't hold it against them too much. Um, but yeah, so uh, so they're making a podcast about the Good Omens TV show. It's called Welcome to the End Times. Uh, and so you should be able to find that uh, in the iTunes store um, and on Twitter. You can find them Uh, at chipperish okay so that's it for this episode i'm anya and you can follow me on twitter at strangely literal that's strangely then l-i-t-e-r-l you can follow the show on twitter at shadow shambler and visit our website at shadowsandshamblers.com and if you'd like to leave us feedback you can visit shadowsandshamblers.com slash contact or send an email to contact at halloodgroundmedia.com And come join us next week for Season 2, Episode 3, Munin. And don't forget to rate and review the show on iTunes. How badly do you want it? I will literally do anything. After we get Shadow. Shadow and Shamblers is a hollowed ground media production.
and is released under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. <laughs>